Hello, happy Monday morning, and welcome back to another episode of Changing Room Thoughts. I'm your host, Karina, and if you're new to my content, Changing Room Thoughts is a podcast for anyone who has ever had a critical thought about the clothes that they put on their bodies. I post new episodes every Monday morning so that you have something juicy to listen to on your way to work. And if you're returning, welcome back. First of all, thanks for your patience. I took a week off of producing the podcast, so thank you so much for still being here. Um the house items that I just wanted to run through before we get into the meat of today's episode. Number one, about two episodes ago, I introduced a giveaway for this lovely fashion history coffee table book, which was so graciously gifted to me by Penguin Random House. I have this book in a newer edition, so that's why I'm doing a giveaway. Just wanted to show my appreciation for your guys' loyal viewership, even after me taking a break for a week, and I'm just so grateful that I get to get on here and do what I do. I've been getting interview requests from publications to speak as a fashion journalist, which is crazy to me, and I really wouldn't be able to have these kinds of opportunities without you guys, so just wanted to give thanks because next week is Thanksgiving. So, you know, it's very timely to be doing a giveaway. I'll be shipping this book out to a lucky winner. All you have to do is share your favorite episode of Changing Room Thoughts on Instagram or TikTok. Just tag my at Karina J Chan on both platforms and you'll be automatically entered into the giveaway. So yeah, I'll be running this until Christmas and I'll ship it out close to Christmas just because I want to give enough time for people to participate. And yeah, that's all. Speaking of fashion journalism and publications, check out the profile that was done on me in the Daily Californian, UC Berkeley's student publication. I'm really chuffed that some student illustrator bothered to go through my TikToks and like draw illustrations of my different outfits. Whoever did shout out to you because I used to be that student journalist in high school. So. I really appreciate it. And again, thank you to my community and to all of you little fashion nerds for supporting me through this journey. Now, last announcement before I get into today's topic. I'm looking for someone who is of Palestinian heritage that has some knowledge about the culture of textile manufacturing or textile heritage in that area. I would love to have you hop on the podcast and I have my own thoughts and I've done a little bit of research into fashion and apparel culture in that that region, but I don't think I should be sharing it without highlighting or like representing someone from that community at the end of the day. Like I'm an East Asian woman making content about like Israel, Palestine in New York. You know, I just like, I want to be tactful. So if that's you, if you're a Palestinian person that has an interest in fashion and want to speak about like the history of the kafia or the history and culture of apparel and textile manufacturing in Gaza, historical or present day, or if you know someone like that, please reach out to me, send me a DM, an email, and I would love to have you on the podcast. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Given that Black Friday is coming up, I wanted to focus today's episode on consumption and our relationship with our clothes. So it's that time of the year again, we're headed back into Black Friday deals. And the fact that we have a holiday dedicated to consumerism is just so American. I think this is also similar to something in the UK like Boxing Day or something like that. And while a day dedicated to sales seems very pragmatic, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I used to, you know, I used to drink the Black Friday shopping craze Kool-Aid, line up at the mall. Once the outlet mall opens, raid the outlet mall, and then just kind of go on a shopping frenzy. But as I've gotten older, I personally, I've grown to hate sales and not because I'm an elitist bitch that dislikes getting things on the cheap but because sales always push me to buy things that I don't really need because it's on sale to me nowadays I don't want to partake in Black Friday because it is so much it is so stressful it's so much time it's so much energy and unless I have a list of things that I am deliberately waiting for a Black Friday sale that I've been coveting the whole year I won't participate and every year Come Black Friday, I never have a list of things that I've been coveting the whole year that I've been waiting for for Black Friday. So I just don't participate. Same thing with sample sales. There's a lot of fashion girlies on social media that are sample sale queens and they're so good at shopping sample sales. I am just not that girl. I am just so stressed. Every sample sale I've been to, like I always feel pressure to buy things just because it's on sale or it's a good deal or this concept that it's like this scarcity mindset that there's only so 
so many items in the sample sale before other people come and snatch it up. In the end, what ends up happening is like after the sale, I end up spending more money than I should have, even though going into this sale, you're thinking, oh, I'm saving money by getting this more cheaply than if I were to buy a full price. Something I want us to think about is that companies don't have Black Friday sales because they are thinking about the consumer's best interest. They're not conducting Black Friday sales because it's good for consumers. It's not because they can tell our wallets are hurting and that we deserve a break from buying products at full price. Companies push Black Friday deals and Black Friday marketing because it's a way for them to get seasonal inventory off of their shelves. The stuff that people didn't want for the entire like rest of the year so that they can give you more things that people still don't want that looks new in time for the next year. So that there's a little food for thought there. I'm not saying like never participate in a Black Friday deal. I'm just saying think about it twice before this seems like a fortuitous event for you because it's not designed to be that way. Our relationship with consumption, sales, and Black Friday brings me to discuss a thought leader I'm really excited to talk about on Changing Room Thoughts. And that is Alec Leach. Alec Leach is the truth, man. Hey, look, if you don't read, this book is real tiny. It's called The World is on Fire, But We're Still Burning Shoes. It's only 150 pages less than, and it's also got pictures. So I highly recommend this book. This is an easy one. It's pocket size take it on the subway it took me an embarrassingly long time to finish just because people don't read people don't read now why am i so enamored by this little book alec leach is the ex-digital editor of high snobiety which which is an esteemed fashion publication covering trends and fashion culture etc quoting from his bio on his website alex leach is an author and strategist in the sustainable fashion space he has been profiled in gq harper's bazaar and dazed published opinion pieces in business of fashion id and the guardian previously he was a digital fashion editor at high snobiety this little book spits some facts like alec leach you can tell by reading this is truly someone who has thought deeply about the relationship with the clothes that he puts on his body so for all of you fashion nerds who Think critically about the clothes you put on your body. You're going to love this book. And I think Alec Leach's journey with fashion echoes our generation's existential dread that many of us face about fashion and its impacts on the environment. Again, I said this before, and I don't think I'm unique in this belief, but I believe that everybody deserves the right to express themselves as authentically as they would want to be, as individualistically as they would want to be, without having to trade off the guilt of harming somebody else or harming our planet in the process. Dress is a major part of the human experience and it is an endlessly satisfying and almost spiritual experience and practice. If fashion is something that you care deeply about, that you enjoy immensely, it's an awful trade-off to have to make every morning when you get dressed, when you think about how the clothes you're putting on cost gallons of petroleum to produce, tons of water to make, hours of slave labor to construct. To quote Alec, fashion isn't really about clothes. If it was, we'd have stopped shopping years ago. If you ask me, it's more like a mirror. When we look into it, we see our hopes, dreams, and fears reflected back at us. Fashion is about who we are, who we want to be, and who everyone else wants to be. I think what this book does a really good job of doing is explaining why, even though we're aware of the environmental impacts of fashion, we are addicted to it and we can't distance ourselves from it. Now, the book starts with a lot of of doom and gloom i'd say a majority of it let's see about a hundred plus pages of this cover the awful effects of fashion in our world it covers the labor strikes of bangladeshi garment workers it covers the lack of transparency throughout the fashion supply chain system which makes it really difficult for us to actually have traceability and accountability on sustainable platitudes it covers the misalignment of incentives and economic structure between brands and manufacturers that pressure manufacturers to produce more for less while also maintaining sustainable commitments, which is unrealistic. It's pretty bleak, the first hundred chapters. It really makes you 
think so critically about the things that you have in your closet. I just want to read a couple of choice quotes from this book that really explain the gravity of the need for truly sustainable solutions in the fashion space. I've seen just how hard fashion's marketing machine works to keep us shopping because I was part of it. The industry expertly hacks human psychology, playing with deep-rooted themes like status and belonging in order to keep us lusting after new things, fueling those same out-of-control shopping habits that are trashing the planet. The sheer scale of this new stuff machine is enormous. It's estimated that between 80 and 150 billion garments are produced every year for just 7.9 billion human beings. In Accra, the capital of Ghana, local textile traders have been bankrupted by the influx of ultra-cheap, throwaway fashion that nobody wants. Accra's landfills are so overflowing that actual mountains have formed of rotting, discarded garments, and the city's beaches are clogged with tangles of clothes which are buried under the sand and floating in the sea, with as yet unknown consequences for the local environment. It's not just making clothes that reinforces colonial power dynamics, where richer countries exploit poorer ones. When we throw them away, we become part of the cycle too. Business of fashion estimates estimates that between 20 and 30 billion dollars in investment is needed across the industry each year for the next decade in order for fashion to scale up innovations to become more sustainable. If brands are silent on where their clothes are coming from, it's often because they don't even know themselves. They're just dealing with their suppliers who are just dealing with their suppliers. In the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013, many brands were surprised to find that their labels were among the rubble of the factory collapse which killed over a thousand Bangladeshi garment workers. The companies selling us things don't know how they're made, and that's actually pretty convenient because what they don't know can't hurt them. So those are just a couple of gems from this small yet mighty book that is chock full of wisdom, an honest look at how fashion and sustainability intersect. If you weren't already made aware of the environmental impacts of fashion on sustainability, I hope that a couple of those quotes have piqued your interest and is enough to set you on a further path of research and exploration to educate yourself on the topic. While the book starts with a lot of doom and gloom, it dishes out the truth of fashion and why it is such an awful contributor to pollution and climate concerns. The bastion of hope is in the last chapter. Now the last 20 or so pages of this book is the hopeful part, which is called The Way Out. In the last chapter, Alec Leach shares the insight that has fundamentally changed the way that I view my relationship to my clothes. It is the closest answer that I can find to my dilemma, which is how can I love fashion if I know what it does to other people and the planet? And the answer is a little bit unexpected, but it is in treating your closet like a relationship. Now, I'm going to call all of y'all out because when a friend is in a toxic relationship with an ex or someone that is just not good for them, it's so easy for us. It is so clear to us what we must do. We must remove ourselves from the relationship, work on ourselves, learn from this situation and make sure that the next person we choose is not like that. Clothing is rarely seen as this kind of relationship. But when you think about it, each piece of clothing you bring into the fold is a relationship that you maintain over time, oftentimes over years, which in some cases has outlasted a lot of my previous relationships. I mean, think about it like in the short term, obviously you hang them, you fold them, you wash them, you take it to the dry cleaners. Maybe you get it tailored. Maybe you get some of them fixed. You decide how to wear them. You decide whether or not it's something you want to get rid of, something you want to keep in your life. This goes goes on for years, yet this consideration is rarely made at the time of purchase. Alec explains that most relationships with clothing can be summed up in three ways, love, failure, and ambivalence. It's a little bit like Marie Kondo, you know, does this spark joy? When you get rid of something, you can, you know, mourn the loss and seek like emotional closure with an item that you've decided to let go. I'm gonna put up the image used to describe these charts, but here in the book, you can see that there are charts indicating what love of an item over time looks like relative to time 
and happiness over time, what failure of an item looks like, and what ambivalence looks like. I'm gonna go through each one of these, describe what that relationship is, and then be a little vulnerable and give you examples from my own closet of things that I've regretted, things that I've felt ambivalent about, and things that I have loved. To keep this analysis consistent, I'll just focus on one category, which is handbags. I'm gonna read from his book an example of a moment of failure. Every item you have is, in its own way, a relationship you're in. When you view shopping as a relationship, the significance and reward of only buying what we truly love becomes so much clearer. For every purchase that gave me joy, there was one or a few that did the opposite. With regret purchases, the things I bought but will never truly love, I never got further than the initial excitement. They quickly became a burden. During my time as an editor, I forget when exactly, I was browsing through lookbooks, probably Kelly time at work. I came across a brand that was inspired for a season by motocross or touring cars. The guy in the lookbook was hanging out at a racetrack in one of those paneled boxy racing jackets that motocross riders wear. I don't know anything about motocross or touring cars or even cars full stop. But at that moment, I decided that yes, I urgently needed to look like someone who drives very fast for a living. A paneled red and beige suede racing jacket was what had been missing my whole life. I just didn't know it. So I bought it and it wasn't cheap because it was shipped from Canada. I needed to go to the customs office on the other side of Berlin to pick it up and pay some import duties. I hadn't thought much about the sizing, so it was a bit small. So more work, emailing the brand, taking the jacket to the post office and waiting around a month for the new one to come back. This time, the lining was slightly too too big, which pulled down on the edges of the suede, ruining the silhouette, more work returning it, more time waiting for it to come back. Turns out a red suede racing jacket wasn't missing from my life. I didn't need one at all, actually. It didn't do anything for me. It was sort of shapeless wearing a red jacket definitely did not make me feel like that carefree guy who drives really fast. It made me feel like a giant red thing. Not carefree. Not at all. I wore it once and it took me about two years to get rid of it. I sold it on an app for a big loss. That whole time I'd kept it hidden away in my flat. I didn't like looking at it. It made me feel like a failure. We don't regret purchases that bring something meaningful into our lives and our time and money is wasted on those that bring us nothing. I never got further than the initial excitement and it quickly became a burden. That red racing jacket was a waste of my money and my time and energy too. And what can you do then? You can hide them in the corner of your closet, but something that's out of sight still takes up space. You could resell them, more work, throw them away, a waste, or donate them, which seems like a guilt-free option, but trust me, so much of the time, it isn't. And if we're honest with ourselves, none of these things feel good. There's guilt to be found there. So if I were to share a moment of guilt and regret purchase, it would be this bag. And I still have it and I still wear it because I refuse to get rid of it because of how much I paid for it. And it is this exotic skin, Lady Dior, and don't get me wrong, she's gorgeous. And, you know, I still wear her from time to time. But this is the purchase I regret the most. And this was when I was younger and not as mature about my money. I came through a windfall of cash due to some smart investments and decided to just blow it on something. I was vacationing with my friend in Hawaii, saw this bag, and just wanted to come back from the vacation with something resplendent. I didn't know what, I just wanted something. This bag is about the same price as that of a used motorcycle. I know this because my roommate at the time was looking into used motorcycles, and when he was telling me how much they were, I thought, oh my God, that's the same cost as a bag. I could trade this piece of leather for a vehicle that would get me from point A to point B. But no, instead I bought this bag. And while she's gorgeous and I'll probably pass her down through my family, through my progeny, that's how I can possibly justify this. She is so fragile. I am terrified of taking her out anywhere because she's not only an exotic leather, but she's white. She's white. I spilled some salad dressing once on the strap, wiped it off. But after that experience, never, never again. I rarely bring her out. And I regret this so much because I spent all that money and I'm too scared to wear her around. Big regret purchase. And when I think about her sometimes, it brings me this sense of shame, like, this was not a wise decision in my life. The adrenaline, the ecstatic feeling I got when I 
first purchased her was insane. I felt like such a rock star. But over time, my happiness relative to the time of purchase has been consistently much lower. So that is an example of failure in a relationship to a piece of clothing. Okay, now the second relationship that I want to dissect is ambivalence. Again, I'm going to read Alec Leach's example of ambivalence. I have a much more ambivalent relationship with my Gucci loafers. I spent ages thinking about them. After months of research, I bought them as a birthday present to myself. So definitely not an impulse buy. Have you ever tried being a normal person in Gucci loafers? It's impossible. The soles are so thin that you feel every step under your feet. That's probably great when there's a carpet in your limo, but when you live in Berlin and take the U-Bahn everywhere, it's not so much. The leather is so soft that I feel like my toes will rip out of them if I put a foot wrong. They look great obviously, but they're so delicate that I feel like I'm wearing a Ming vase on my feet. Now they're my birthday shoes. They do make me feel like a billionaire, which I know is the entire point. But five years later, I can think of a hundred better ways to spend that money. Now in the graph that shows the association between happiness over time for an ambivalent relationship to a piece of clothing, there's kind of rocky moments. It goes up, it goes down, it kind of flatlines over time. For me, an ambivalent relationship with a handbag would be my first ever luxury handbag, which is a Celine bag. Now, this bag is not the worst. I definitely think I chose a smart, like tasteful, beautiful bag as my first luxury purchase. But the reason why I feel ambivalent about this bag over time is because this strap is really tiny. So you have to wear it on your wrist like this all the time, which is kind of annoying. Second, the leather strap that it comes with is way too long and it kind of hangs. It's more of like a crossbody length, which I hate. I realize now I am the kind of girl that is shoulder bag only. I hate having to carry bags in my hand like this. I feel like I'm going to lose them. I also hate crossbodies because first of all, I just think they look ugly. Sorry. Second of all, I hate when they like dangle at your hip. When you turn around, they swing and they hit shit. It's just like, no, no, it's just not it. The other issue with this bag is that this print, even though it's really cool and limited edition and so chic and perfect for the fall, that's about the only time I can wear this bag is in the fall. And it is such a preppy print that it's hard to style. It can only work with certain outfits. That's why I feel ambivalence about this bag because even though it's gorgeous, I rarely get to wear her. I only wear her maybe like twice a year. So this is something that's definitely in my collection, but not something that gets nearly as much love as I would have hoped it would. Now, of course, the last feeling, now, of course, the last type of relationship that you can have with a piece of clothing is love. Now, this is Alex's example of love. Modern Life is War was a punk rock band from Iowa. They were my favorite band when I was 18. I never saw them live. They hardly played in the UK and split up after a few records. But their music really touched me. And a decade after I first heard of them, I found a web store in Poland that was selling their merch. It's a typical band tee. It costs something like 15 euros, including shipping. I've worn it to death. The screen print has cracked into a hundred shards of white, which sit on a scratchy gilded blank that's been washed so many times that it now feels soft against my skin. I love it. The funny thing is, I wasn't even that bothered when I bought it. I definitely wasn't as excited about it as I was for so many other things I bought then later regretted. But it didn't take long for that tea to become part of my life. The thing with wearing teas to death is that after a few years, you can really smell it. I tried everything to get that old t-shirt smell out. I soaked it in baking soda, put vinegar in the washing machine, left it out in the sun for a week. I finally won by spraying the tea with pure vinegar essence and leaving it on my balcony for a few days. I can't quite describe the feeling I got from getting that tea back into my life. Kind of like passing my driving test, kind of like being reunited with an old friend. All these years later, what have I gotten out of this piece of fabric? It fits great, I love the print. I love how it's cracked over the years, I can wear it with anything. There's also this silent bond with anyone who like me, fell in love with that kind of music when they were young. But I think the real reason that it's so important to me now is that I liked it enough in the first place to work on it. And the more I put into it, the more loyal I became to it. When things got tough, I put the work in because I wanted it in my life just like a friend or a lover it was worth every minute now the associated graph with a loving relationship to an item over time is obviously sustained happiness over time that is equal to if not more than the happiness experience at the time of purchase for me that is this bag and similarly i thought nothing of it when i got it it was 
five dollars at the flea market in san francisco it was like an outdoor flea market it was hanging on a clothing rack completely ignored and this thing is now battered to shreds if you follow me you've seen my outfits on tiktok on instagram chances are like seven out of ten times i'm wearing this bag this bag i have learned so many things about myself with this bag first of all it's a shoulder bag which means it is so functional for me i don't have to worry about losing it i can carry it and just kind of forget that i'm even wearing it sometimes because it's comfortable secondly i've always had a thing for metallic very paco raban type textures and what i love about this bag is that on one side it is this ordinary kind of metal chain mail on the other side it is a bit patterned there's a checkered pattern where some squares have the ordinary chain mail and some of them have these more round matte beaded silver balls on it and you can tell at the seams it's kind of breaking at the seams over here is a good example some of these pieces of chain mail are falling off and how i know i love it is that now that it has started to fall apart i am scared of wearing it because i love it so much and I don't want it to be out of my rotation. I've started looking for replacements of this bag and sadly I'm having a hard time finding one but it is something I love so much I would put in the time and effort to a get it fixed and b find a replacement for this bag because I just love it so much and yeah I never could have fathomed at the time of purchasing that I would love this bag as much as I do but reflecting on the relationship that I have with this bag gives me the knowledge to make smarter purchases in the future. Number one, I love metallics and I can style them in so many different ways. Number two, I love shoulder bags. I should focus on buying shoulder bags because I wear them the most. Number three, even though this looks small, this fits everything I need. I learned that I only really carry around my wallet, my two phones, a pair of sunglasses, a phone charger, and one or two lippies. And that fits perfectly in this kind of bag. So yeah, while it sucks that the onus is on the consumer to ensure that fashion doesn't trash the environment even more than it already does. This is a lot of like emotional labor to sustain and reflect on each of your relationships to each piece of clothing or item in your closet. I hope that this reframing of clothes as relationships helps us maintain healthier habits, balance our consumption, and change the way that we fundamentally think about our purchases. Let me know if you have any examples. I have the Q&A and polls open. Let me know if you have any examples of items in your closet that is a reflection of a failed relationship, a loving relationship, or an ambivalent relationship. I would love to have more examples. Don't forget, if you want to enter the giveaway for the coffee table book, to share, tag me in a story, post, or whatever on Instagram with your favorite episode of Changing Room Thoughts. And I'll see you guys next Monday. Happy Thanksgiving and happy Black Friday shopping. I just hope that you come out of Black Friday with things that you love. All right. Bye.